I had to switch computers. My other one is so slow. It's only got three computers attached to it. I guess that's probably why. <laughs> anyway. All right. We'll wait and make sure everybody is here. This is a small class. So let's see. I said four, 440, so I need to give everybody that time. So this week, um, <laughs> other than your exam, you need to be working on your uh, your healthy newborn case study. Remember, these are not timed. Okay, so take your time. Um, they're for learning. Uh, so take your time, look up the answers. There's no reason that you shouldn't be looking up answers. Uh, and uh, so that you can score as high as possible on the, on those. And then you have a discussion question again this week. And it's about a diabetic. So keep in mind all the things you learned about diabetes so far. And um, I don't want anybody to diagnose her with gestational diabetes. Why? Why don't I want anybody to diagnose her with the gestational di as with gestational diabetes? She already has a history of type two. Okay, she's a pre-gestational pre diabetic, yeah, yeah. So don't diagnose her with, with um, gestational. If you did, that's okay. It happens all the time. It can be very confusing, I know that. Okay, so we're talking about the newborn this week. And next week, we'll be talking about it again, a baby again, but adding in the high risk. Okay, so... This week and next week, um, most of your exam three is going to cover this week and next week because you have another exam in week nine. Okay, so we are having more study sessions next week for your next exam. Okay, so if you don't, if you did not feel confident uh, with the, the exam that you just took and you feel discouraged, then think about why didn't why did I feel discouraged? Why didn't I know what I thought I knew or whatever? And maybe consider a different strategy for getting ready and reach out to me. Okay. Um, I will have my sessions again Thursday evening and Sunday evening. I'll have two sessions and we'll do kind of like we did before, do some scenarios on on babies. Uh, what would you see if your baby had pathological jaundice? Okay, or physiological jumps, why? And then what, what do you need to do about it? What kind of teaching would you provide your client? Okay, as far as the newborn, um, um, you see one slide up here, it's 42. It, you see a slide up here that I'm showing you and it talks about what you would expect within that first 30 minutes after delivery. So this is a time of adjustment, okay? Adjustment to the extra uterine life. Um, when we clamp that cord, so um, I kind of get ahead of myself sometimes. There is a concept or a phenomenon, not phenomenon, but a concept of a, um, a um, not really a standard either. It's, it's the way a lot of OB providers are practicing now. When the baby's born, they delay clamping the cord for about a minute. Um, that allows more blood from the placenta to be, you know, given to the newborn. Okay. Uh, sometimes newborns, if we clamp the cord right away, they become anemic. They don't really have enough blood. So we we delay cord clamping, and that helps with increasing blood pressure, providing extra RBCs. Uh, for, for the newborn, okay? So that we do delay the cord clamping. Once that cord is clamped, the pressure systems in the baby change, okay? During the intrauterine life, everything was low pressure, okay? But now the cardiovascular system and the pulmonary system of our new baby with a clamped cord 
adjusts. Okay, we clamp the cord and the blood pressure goes up in the newborn. Okay, and the ductus arteriosus that had the blood flow that's been diverted from the lungs now begins to perfuse the lungs um, and that opening begins to close up. Okay, so those, those are huge changes. Um, and the gas exchange for the baby to have oxygen in the lungs now requires good lung perfusion of blood and for the baby to breathe. Okay, the in intrauterine life of a, of a fetus, the baby really didn't have to breathe. Uh, the, the oxygen was already in the baby's blood from mom, but now the baby has to do the work. Okay, so it's uh, the sympathetic nervous system modulates this. Okay, so what we usually see in a newborn and what we want to see is a very alert and active baby that's getting used to everything, okay? Crying, spontaneous startles, okay? Uh, transient type tremors. The heart rate's gonna be high because it's trying to perfuse those lungs, okay? 160 to 180 is not uncommon for the first 30 minutes, maybe up to an hour, okay? So after that first period of, we call it reactivity, um, it dropped, the heart rate will drop down between 100 and 120. So meaning if, if your baby is awake after 30 minutes, um, their heart rate might be, you know, at the top at 120. But if baby usually goes to a really quiet stage, and so it might drop down to 100, okay? Respirations, those first 30 minutes are irregular, okay? Getting used to breathing air. Okay, 60 to 80 breaths a minute. And you're gonna hear some crackles because they're still working on getting rid of the excess fluid in the lungs, okay? But after that first 30 minutes or so, we, see, we need to see less um, irregularity. We need to see some more regu regular breathing, less crackles. Um, but if they continue on with, a lot of irregularity and the rate remains very high above 80. Um, if the baby's nose, the nasal passages, the nares are flaring and a lot of grunting going on, then there's some distress, okay? But they sh we often see that for the first 30 minutes to an hour, okay? So what do you think are the two most important things we need to keep in mind um, as far as protecting a newborn or making sure it's safe. And um, I don't know if that'll help you answer. The, the, ver the two things that are most important about a newborn and early in those first few hours. The connection between it and its mother. Okay. Um, Yes, that's important, but I'm thinking more of a physiological need. We're, we're way um, down on the Maslow's hierarchy. The oxygen, like the breathing. breathing and and eating. Air, air air pattern. So breathing is one. What do you think the other one is? Circulation. Heart rate. Heart rate, circulation. Regulating their temperature. Temperature, right. temperature regulation. Yeah, a newborn cannot regulate their own temperature. They're dependent upon us. They're dependent upon the environment around them. So respirations and temperature regulation. So how do we how do we manage that? What are some things you think you can do as a nurse? Now, I know a lot of you probably haven't looked at the material yet. I get it. Um, but just use your common sense or think about what are some ways we can address both of those things. Thanks. Well, the, what, that's one of the things I was saying that, you know, you put them with their mother because, the, you know, the warmth of her possible body. But sometimes like if you have like a baby that's born like and it's like yellow and it still like looks like jaundice after 30 minutes, they normally like cover up the baby's eyes and like put them in certain kind of lighting. Okay, so yeah, you bring up a really good point. Skin to skin, 
Okay, skin to skin, baby on mother's abdomen or chest. Um, that is a number one thing we want to do because yes, that, that helps the baby uh, retain warmth. It provides a lot of stability for baby. Good. So warmth, that's one way we can help with warmth. What do you think is another way we can help with temperature control, keeping our baby warm? Clothes, hat, double swaddles. Use uh, a warmer creep. Okay, okay. So um, ideally skin to skin, we need to dry the baby, stimulate that baby, make that baby breathe and cry and put a hat on. Okay, those are the most initial things we need to do. So just picture that baby born, okay? A minute later, we're suctioning, the, we're, well, as soon as the baby's born, we're suctioning the mouth and the nose. We're drying the baby off, clamping the cord on mommy's tummy, put a hat on, okay? Those are the first few minutes, okay? So these, the next couple slides, it described the physiological processes of respiration, what causes a baby to breathe, okay? So uh, there's uh, chemo receptors. I don't know if you've learned about those in med surge. They're particular cells and they are in the carotid arch and the uh, aortic uh, arch, okay? Baroreceptors, chemoreceptors, and they measure the, uh, they, they sense, they're a receptor and they sense the level of oxygen and they stimulate the baby to breathe, okay? So pressure, increased pressure stimulates the baby to breathe uh, because they're talking to the baby's brain and, they, and they're telling the baby breathe, okay? During labor, all babies experience, is a, experience a little bit of hypoxia. So that low level of oxygen in their blood is what stimulates these receptors. So after they're born, it tells the brain, baby, you need to breathe, okay? So that's one thing, okay? So, uh, and sometimes just the, the uh, negative uh, intrathoracic pressure, it's being changed in the, and the air is being filled up in the lungs and that stimulates baby uh, to breathe. And you don't have to memorize these, but get an idea of the things around the baby and the things within the baby that are causing the baby to breathe. The temperature, cool temperature makes you breathe faster. Um, stimulating a baby, okay? Um, and then because of the fluid in the lungs, some of them have more than others, that makes the baby cough and they cry and it helps them to breathe. Now, there are certain situations and high risk situations where if there is more fluid in the lungs than should be, um, what happens or why? So we've talked about meconium aspiration, okay? Um, meconium in the intrauterine life is not a problem. The problem is after they're born. If they've got meconium all over their face, it's easy to aspirate. So when, when that head is delivered, we're wiping the meconium off and we're suctioning with the bulb syringe, okay? And then of course, there are some congenital anomalies or abnormalities that can cause retention. And then of course, the premature babies, they don't have adequate surfactants. Okay, so supporting the airway, as soon as that baby is born, Let's use our bulb syringe and suction that mouth out, okay? We do the mouth before the nose. Babies are obligate nose breathers. They always breathe through their nose. So when we suction their mouth, it doesn't stop them from breathing. Um, it's a stimulation. And so they respond to that stimulation. And when they're responding, it tells us some inf information too, that their neurological system is intact. Okay, so we need to support the airway and then think about temperature. So this is just a chart. What would you do if your baby wasn't breathing? 
okay, or the respirations were very labored, what would you do? And it takes you through the algorithm. And this is really beyond um, the context of this class, but I wanted you to have it. Um, most of the time we do, we're not real aggressive as far as intubation. We do positive pressure ventilation first, okay? Because sometimes they just need like some pressure to help those alveoli continue to pop open, okay? All right. So some signs of respiratory distress then, and you do need to know this, even though this is high risk too, um, respirations is usually the cause of a baby not doing well. Um, usually uh, before uh, heart problems, it's our respirations they're having trouble with, okay? So signs of distress then, I've got the whole list here for you. And then I've got your pictures here, nasal flaring, and then intercostal retractions or other retractions, using muscles to help open the lungs up, to help pull the lungs to the chest wall so that they can expand. So in this picture down below, you see between those ribs, how those muscles are actually sunk in. They're retracting because they're actually contracting Okay, and they're trying to bring that lung to the chest wall. Grunting. Strider. Strider is a sound. If you have ever experienced a child uh, or someone with croup, it's a very musical. It's an upper airway obstruction. So if you have a, a, a newborn with strider, they probably have a lot of fluid up there. They're still trying to, to get rid of. Okay. Hypotonia. In other words, they're not stiff. Their, their extremity, it's almost flaccid because all their energy is going into breathing. So they're a hypotonic. Okay. And then central cyanosis. So what is central cyanosis? It's a sign of respiratory difficulty in any adult. So what is central cyanosis? What, what would you see if you thought, oh no, got some cyanosis going on here, hypoxia? Blue what would you tongue. think? What'd you say, Mia? Um, it was Crist when, um, wouldn't you see bluish? Yeah, so on the right tongue, here, blue, blue, bluish around the mouth, membranes, oral membranes are bluish, okay? Um, what is acrocyanosis and is it the same? Anybody know what acrocyanosis is? It's bluish around the hands and feet. Okay, yeah, so it doesn't have, acrocyanosis has nothing to do with respiration. Uh, Mia, do you know what, what it is? What, why would a baby's hands and feet be bluish? It's just different perfusion, um, like when the baby's born. Yeah, yeah. Their perfusion is kind of immature at first. It's slow. It takes a while. Okay. And so we just typically just rub, swaddle the baby to help improve that perfusion and warm up the baby. Okay. So it doesn't have anything to do with uh, respirations, but the cyanosis does. So the word scion means blue, okay? So if you have a newborn with respirations less than 30, you need to know the normal root, uh, newborn respiratory rate. Less than 30 or greater than 60, they're in trouble, okay? Less than 30 or greater than 60, okay? So, so they if they're breathing- 30 to 60 or 40 to 60? Then 30. The normal respiration, 30 to 60? Yeah, 30 to 60. Okay. Okay. So less than 30 or greater than 60. So tachypnea means breathing too fast. So that means they're trying to probably trying to get rid of that extra fluid in their lungs. Or they don't have enough surfactant. They're premature. 
or they're uh, the baby of a diabetic mother and they're having some respiratory distress syndrome and it's because they don't have inadequate surfactant. Sometimes it is related to the heart. And then of course, meconium, aspiration. They're gonna have a high respiratory rate. It's normal for a newborn to have periods of apnea. Okay, as long as it's less than 20 seconds, it's normal, but you certainly want to monitor your baby. So if it's beyond 20 seconds, you need to stimulate, wake that baby up. You might have to do some, put a mat, a facial, facial mask on, you know, bag them a little bit with some positive pressure ventilation to support their oxygenation and to stimulate them. So as Devon says, skin to skin care, when that baby is delivered and baby is stable, doesn't seem to be in any distress, um, needs to go to mom's tummy, okay? Um, when we put a newborn skin to skin on mom's tummy, not only does it promote thermal stability, okay? Thermal stability, temperature, warming so what kind of well we haven't talked about that yet i got ahead of myself cardiopulmonary stability gets that heart rate regular and within norms respiratory rate regular regulation the adjustment to the extra uterine environment goes much more smoothly if we put baby on mama's chest and of course it facilitates bonding devon mentioned that as well that mother um, newborn dyad, it's called, that that bonding. Um, and then it's the first opportunity for breastfeeding. Uh, and you think, wait a minute, how, does that baby know how to breastfeed? Well, yeah, they have all kinds of reflexes, okay? They have a rooting reflex. If you touch the side of a newborn right here, next to the mouth, they will actually turn their head in that direction because they're rooting for something to eat. And then they suck. Sucking is another reflex activity. Uh, have you ever seen um, a, a dog or a cat give birth? What do they do? They climb over and find the nipple. Well, humans do the same thing, okay? That baby will root around. So it's a great opportunity to begin that baby on breastfeeding. And especially, you know, our diabetic mothers, um, these babies need food uh, so they don't become hypoglycemic. Okay. So it's an advantage for that as well. So one minute after they're born. So we've got baby on mother's chest. And we have done everything we can. Baby seems to be doing well. So we're going to do a quick assessment. One minute after. It's called APGAR. Okay, and this was developed by a female um, obstetrician, just a tool that we can use across the board uh, for all babies. So we, we know what's going on. So Apgar, that was her last name. Her name was Virginia Apgar. So each, the word Apgar stands for different parameters. Okay, um, one, two, three, four, five parameters we're going to assess. And then we're going to score each one, zero, one, or two. Now, the best score, the most perfect baby is going to be a 10. Okay. If we have a baby that scores less than five, they're in moderate distress. Okay. Less than three, they're in severe distress. Okay. We really need to do some intervention. So we like to see between seven and 10. Okay. So a baby born that has good coloring. There's no signs of any kind of cyanosis. Their body, their oral membranes, pink. Okay. If hands and feet are blue, um, and it's not uncommon, some acrocyanosis doesn't have anything to do with respiration. We're just talking about color now. So it's about perfusion. Um, we're only going to give them a one. And then if that baby is born blue, then zero. 
So we go through each of these parameters. So pulse is a heart rate. We want our baby's heart rate to be above 100. In fact, we want it to 150, 160. If it's less than 100, they only get one. And of course, if they don't have a heartbeat, it's zero. And the G stands for grimace. It, it, it really is a reflex mechanism. Okay, we want to see good reflex activity. So if our baby is crying, pulling away, doesn't like us suctioning the baby, doesn't like us um, holding the arm, they tend to pull away from us, um, that's a two. That's a very active baby with good reflex activity. But if they have a very weak cry and they're only grimacing when we stimulate them, they're not really responding as well, then we're only going to give them one. And of course, if there's no reflex activity, no response to suction, that would be a zero. And the A is about activity, okay? Um, if our baby is moving upper and lower extremities, moving around, that's a two. But if they're not really moving a lot, but their extremities are flexed or somewhat flexed, then we're only gonna give them a one. And then of course, no movement would be a zero. And the last area is respiration, okay? Good, strong cry, we're gonna give them a two. But if their respirations are, it's a very weak cry, slow respirations are very irregular for a while, um, then only a one. And then of course, a zero would be no breathing. Okay, so you just have to memorize APGAR. And then at the five minute mark, we're gonna do APGAR again. So that's why you usually see like a seven, a seven or nine, seven, eight, seven. You'll see two numbers. So this is a review again. Uh, the first two hours, our focus is vigorous drying, skin to skin, bonding with mother and APGAR. We could have let her bond with the baby for up to two hours before we really have to do anything else, okay? After those two hours, we need to go ahead and do two very important things. And we call it eyes and thighs. So we want to put some erythromycin gel in the conjunctiva down below on both sides. This is a prophylactic use of erythromycin gel to prevent um, ophthalmia neonatorum uh, or conjunctivitis caused by gonorrhea, okay? Uh, we make the assumption that gonorrhea is there and uh, it's actually a law in most states um, that you have to provide the gel. And the reason is we know gonorrhea can cause blindness. So just in case, Let's just do a simple thing and put gel in and prevent blindness, okay? Now, chlamydia is another infection, right? That a woman can carry in her, carry in her genital tract, but it's not gonna cause blindness, okay? And we don't treat chlamydia topically. We have to give oral medication. And so it's not gonna present itself till later, okay? but we do treat with the ointment in the eye. So eyes and thighs. So thigh, we give an intramuscular injection into the newborn's thigh with vitamin K. Um, they don't have vitamin K available to them because their gut is not working yet. They have no food in their system and they're not gonna have any vitamin K available in their intestines for probably about a week, okay? Babies need, we need, we all need vitamin K for liver to work, for the liver to be able to make blood clotting factors, such as prothrombin, okay? So bacteria, normal bacteria in the intestines are what produce vitamin K. Of course, we get it in the foods we eat too, but we have bacteria that provides that. But a newborn, they haven't eaten yet, right? They have nothing in their stomach. 
So um, once we begin feeding the baby after about a week, then they, their intestines begin to produce vitamin K. So in the meantime, we give them an injection so that they have it, so that the liver can produce the prothrombin. I don't know if you're familiar with anything about um, Jewish history, uh, back before um, anyone knew about what caused babies to bleed the first week or so, um, they used to postpone um, their circumcisions for a week after the baby was born. Because if they waited a week, then the babies didn't bleed. But if they circumcised the little boys, you know, after the baby was born, they would bleed, 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 bleed because there was no natural vitamin K in the newborn's body. So they figured out if they waited a week. So um, that's just the history of the Jews. Okay, so eyes and thighs. Any questions about babies so far? You know, um, the this slide set, the first, you know, 10 slides or so are, are the most critical information you need to understand. Um, the normal newborn. Um, and this is how we start all newborn assessments. Okay. So when we think about now that we know what respiration is about, um, let's think about heat generation, how you and I generate heat. Our bodies know how to shiver. Our bodies know how to sweat, right? We know that if we move around, we get warm. Well, a newborn cannot sweat and cannot shiver for several days. Okay, so they are dependent upon us. They do try to generate some heat with increased muscle activity and vasoconstriction. Okay, but when they do that, they're using up a lot of energy that they don't have. They don't have any energy reserves. Okay, so they can easily go into cold stress that causes metabolic acidosis. Okay, they can go, they can have hypothermia, hypothermia very easily. So we teach mom and dads that if you're comfortable in a room with just a t-shirt on, so is the baby, okay? If you have ambient temperature, if you have your air conditioner or your furnace or your heat pump set between 72 and 78 degrees, your newborn is gonna be comfortable with just a nice layer of clothing on. Okay, but if it's cooler than that, they're going to need another layer of clothes. Okay, we don't want them to overheat their babies by really putting all these heavy clothes and blankets on their babies. Okay, so we do need to protect them from hyperthermia because they don't sweat. Okay, so they can get heated up if you wrap your baby too much. Okay, you know, um, I got to tell you a story, and I and I didn't tell my Monday classes, but my husband and I took a a real quick trip to New York to see Phantom of the Opera. And you know, in New York, everybody and everybody and everybody, you're out on the street, right? People everywhere, even during COVID. I mean, you are next to people everywhere. And there was a couple, they had two children. They had one in a um, stroller, right? An older child. And then they were carrying a baby that could not have been four weeks old. They were carrying this baby no hat, no, I mean, legs were, were. Um, I mean, there was no protection for that newborn. I'm thinking, uh, where did you have your baby? <laughs> you know, because they, it's like they didn't know that baby gets cold easily and it was chilly. Um, so I, I really wanted to stop him and say, you know, you need to cover your baby up. But I guess what bothered me even more than that, the exposure to the viruses available. A four-week newborn shouldn't be out in public. And I'm old school. They shouldn't be out in public before six weeks. And now that we have these pandemics, they need to really delay exposing their, their new babies to, to crowds like that. Um, anyway, so thermogenesis, uh, babies, they need our help. They lose heat very easily. Um, so when you think about how a newborn loses heat, there's four mecha mechanisms and I've got the pictures here. So you need to know these as well, because if you're gonna work in a newborn nursery, you need to avoid certain things. So you don't want any cool drafts nearby if your baby's not dressed accordingly, okay? 
If your baby just has a onesie on and the arms and the legs are not covered up, then um, if there is a draft, um, they lose heat. That heat is pulled from the baby's body. It's called convection, okay? Convection, that is one way of a baby, how a baby loses heat. Another way is if you lay your baby who's not got many clothes on, on a surface that's cold. Um, if, you, if you work in a nursery and you're getting ready to weigh your newborn with just a diaper on, um, you don't wanna put it directly on that scale because this scale is metal and it's cold. So we're gonna put a blanket down first and then zero out the scales, okay? A baby loses heat if it touches something cold. Radiation, that's being some being near something that's cold, okay, that draws heat, okay, a cool surface of some sort. And then, of course, bathing your baby. Uh, when the baby is wet, they lose heat. Just think about when you when you get wet, if you've been swimming, even though it's 80 degrees out when you get out of the pool, it feels cool because you're losing some heat. Well, babies lose heat when they're wet. So when we bathe newborns, we want, only want to expose part of their body that we're bathing. So keep the baby covered up as you go. So this is, these are um, some of the things that we have to teach moms. They don't realize it. They might be very comfortable, don't realize it's cold. So that's why, you know, we, we vigorously dry our babies after they're born to get, you know, make sure that there's no wetness on them. So we treat them kind of like an elderly patient, like when we've given like bed baths, basically. Yeah, yeah, that's a good thought. An elderly person can't regulate their heat sometimes either. They tend to get colder. So yeah, we're we're not going to just take everything off and start washing, they're gonna get cold and they're gonna let you know, aren't they? <laughs> um, cardiovascular problems in a newborn is very rare, but if they have persistent tachycardia, in other words, if their heart rate remains above 160, what, what are we thinking? Well, anemia, okay, they're, they've lost some blood or they're anemic, um, hypovolemia, um, tachycardia from having a fever, hyperthermia, or sepsis. So those are the, some of the things that you might think about. If your newborn stays with a high heart rate, then you're concerned about anemia. Why would a, why would a newborn be born with anemia? I know you might not know this answer, but just think about it. Why would a newborn have anemia? Does anybody have any idea? Because the mother has anemia. Okay, that might be that might be a reason, but maybe not. Baby should have, have red blood cells developing. So what could have occurred during the pregnancy? Poor nutrition. I'm sorry? Poor nutrition. I didn't understand. Because the mother has poor, poor nutrition during the pregnancy. I'm still having trouble understanding. She I said, said poor, poor nutrition. nutrition. Poor nutrition. Um, probably not. Remember we talked about mother having RH negative status? that there in her blood, there's a certain um, antigen that she does not have, okay? And so baby does have RH positive, she, the baby does. And sometimes if there's an opportunity for that blood to mix during the pregnancy and mother's not given Rogam, and then even during that pregnancy, she, her body can make antibodies against that baby's um, antigen, okay? In other words, 
the blood is not compatible. Okay, I'll put it that way. The blood between mother and baby has mixed during the pregnancy and it's not compatible. Or during a previous pregnancy, she had she has Rh negative and she did not get Rogam. Okay, so from a previous pregnancy, she did not give Rogam. So she's got a, uh, antibodies against the, the D antigen. So when she carries a D baby, her immune system begins um, attacking the, the fetus red blood cells. So hemolysis is occurring and that's why anemia develops. So this baby that is born with anemia because of an RH factor issue has jaundice, okay? Okay, so it's the baby has pathological jaundice. So if you see a newborn um, within those first few hours or at delivery who's jaundiced, then they're anemic, severely anemic because their red blood cells are break, being broken down because of blood incompatibility, okay? All right, so persistent bradycardia, it's gonna be less than 80. So usually this is a some kind of congenital heart block um, or just a, a malformation. Um, tetralogy of Fallot, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a, it's sometimes we see that from uh, diabetic mothers who are hyperglycemic. Um, drugs, things like that can cause uh, tetralogy. Um, or a, a family history, okay? All right, so look at the pictures in your text about newborn reflexes, because you're gonna remember them if you see pictures. And I don't have pictures in the slides and I don't even have the page number for you, <laughs> okay? I might've put them in that other sheet I sent you, okay? So remember that, if there was any neurological damage during pregnancy, the neurological um, um, maturity is gonna be diminished, okay? So if your baby doesn't have a reflex or has very slow reflexes, it's a sign of neuromuscular, or not neuromuscular, but neurological damage, okay? So like I said earlier, transient tremors, you know, they tremor, their little hands will shake, ooh, usually right at the beginning, first week or so. Um, they should have some passive resistance to movement. If you were to try to straighten their arm out, they would resist that a little bit because they are flexed, okay? Normally a newborn is always flexed, but if they tend to be extended and there's no resistance when you try to move their arms that's a concern okay they should suck and they should root for a breast okay they should have the grasping reflex when you put your finger in their hands or under their toes they should be grasping okay moro is what we call the startle reflex if you make a loud noise babies will well, you know, they'll reach forward as if they're grabbing a big tree or something, okay? That's the moral reflex. And then you need to know the Babinski. Who knows what a Babinski? Now, we talked about this in health assessment. What is a Babinski? Do you remember? <laughs> like if you stroke the bottom of their foot, it's how they flex. It. Okay. Do they flex or do they extend? Sorry, extend. Okay, so baby's foot, if you can see this. So if we stroked around the lateral portion of that foot and up behind the toes, we wanna see those toes go boing. Okay, that's a positive Babinski. That is normal for a newborn, not for an adult. Okay, an adult, we wanna see this, okay? A newborn, we want to see this. So that's positive Babinski. If you see a positive Babinski in an adult, they've got brain damage. Okay. Okay. You, now you probably remember talking about that in, in health assessment. 
Um, yeah, we do vital signs. Um, we're concerned about respiration and heart rate mostly. And of course, temperature. We're not that concerned about blood pressure and we don't always take it unless we, there's some other things going on with her newborn there. We're suspecting some kind of heart defect or if we're suspecting some kind of blood disorder or anemia or something, we might want to check blood pressure or blood loss, things like that. We do weigh our baby, of course, a normal weight, 2,700 grams to 4,000 grams. Anything less than 2,500 is considered low birth weight and anything greater than 4,500 grams is considered macrosomic, okay? You don't need to know the head and chest circumferences, except that the head is usually a little larger than the chest. So if you have a baby boy, Jones, born at 39 weeks and five days, spontaneous vaginal birth one hour ago, he has been skin to skin with his mother and he's breastfeeding eagerly. But in your assessments, you notice these things. Okay, there's a list here. Which ones are concerning to you? Which is your priority? Auto reflex absent? Yeah, yeah. We've got a, a reflex that's absent. When we make a loud so noise, the baby doesn't respond. So it could be um, neurological damage or they might be deaf. Okay. So what would you do? Dorothy, what would you do if you noticed your baby didn't have a moral reflex? You're muted. <laughs> if the baby didn't have a moral reflex, then I would probably go get a, the hearing tested. Okay. What is, anybody else have any ideas what we should do? No moral reflex. The same like thing that we use for like their, to get fluid out of their like throat when we use it on their ear. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Check fluid inside of their ear and then. So, you know, since, since, um, you know, we're not equipped to do that, right? As a nurse, you wouldn't be equipped to do that as a nurse. So um, to help you understand, if there are missing reflexes, they really need, we, you really need as a nurse to contact the provider, okay? And then they would probably want a hearing test and probably do a more of an in-depth neurological assessment, which we do, but not early, okay? So if you're, if you've got your baby and it's, been um, skin to skin with mom and you're checking on them and you notice that um, then then we we would probably want to get the provider involved earlier okay so um, temperature axillary temperature we really don't like anything less than 36.5 so we would probably want to cover the baby up and tell mother you know keeping the hat on keeping the baby warm what would you do with acrocyanosis You remember? So like rub them and try to get the perfusion. Yeah, we're going to explain to mom. It's not. It's 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 not. It's common. Don't don't be concerned about. It. Let's just rub his feet a little bit and let's cover him up. Okay. Heart rate looks fine, right? One twenty five is great. Scrotal edema. That's not uncommon. Okay. We certainly want to assess it eventually, but it's not a priority. Okay. Arms and legs are flex is a good thing, okay? All right, so we've got just a couple more minutes here. So we can finish with this, okay? So which of these below, there's more than one. 
select all that apply, your favorite, right? What are some benefits of really promoting skin to skin, explaining to the mother, let's do this. It's so beneficial to a baby, for a baby. Uh, cardiopulmonary, body temperature. Body. And positive maternal. Bonding. Yep. So this, the first one, right? The third one. Stable and body temperature. One. And the last one. Yes. We don't want lower blue, blood glucose levels. If anything, it's going to increase the blood glucose when you breastfeed. If she's breastfeeding. And it certainly doesn't decrease the need for breastfeeding. They need to eat, right? Especially those diabetic babies. This okay. is a little off topic, but with the blood glucose and breastfeeding, is it the four milk or Han milk that is um, where the like nutrients are? Is it the what kind of milk? Like when they first start feeding, isn't it like just sweeter and then the nutrients come after? Uh, like it's uh, colostrum. Nutrients. Colostrum is the first uh, substance that's produced and colostrum um, has, remember it has IgA in it, an immunoglobulin, an antibody that helps fight um, GI um, uh, infections. And it also helps um, pre uh, prevent uh, or pr protect the baby from viruses. Um, right. And it has I the, IG, IGN, what? Right. But with the normal milk, once it's like leveled off, isn't the, is it steady without nutrient wise or is the beginning like less nutritious? No, no, the, no, colostrum is very nutritious. It's got, it's got enzymes for digestion. And it's got fats in it. No, it's very nutritious. It's it's good because it's also a laxative. So if they have any, if they have some elevation of bilirubin, it helps get rid of the excess bilirubin. No, it's very very uh, beneficial. But then it does uh, it changes. Yeah, it, we have the true milk coming in. Mm -hmm. But that beginning is very important because it meets the need of the newborn for three or four days before the real milk comes in. Right, That's I was referring question. to the real milk, not the colostrum. Yeah, well, the real milk might not have the all the immunoglobulins like the colostrum does. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you can look through the rest of these, make sure you're familiar with the different integumentary things that you can see on a newborn. And we'll probably have fun with that um, uh, when we do our exam review. I just, I did give you some pictures. Um, just so you know, um, letter H, little guy. Um, there's nothing wrong with that little guy. He just has real special hair. <laughs> so, um, but if you, you need to notice everything else, you need to be, what are all these? You need to know all this stuff. Okay. So go ahead and review. And I've got some videos in here to help you understand what really do we mean by a cephalohematoma and a kaput, what's molding. So there's some good videos that you can watch to look at that stuff. Sometimes videos do more. Okay. So this, um, these PowerPoints just about have everything you need to know about the about chapters 22 and 23. Okay. All right. So we will get your grades to you. Um, 